Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Blockchain Africa 22 report back session. Tony Perry is the host, but I cannot see him right now. So I think he might have been um, might have been cut out. So I will just give him another few seconds to see if he comes back into the room and uh, we can continue thereafter. Can people just uh, write in the chat if they can hear me, please? Hi, Tony, are you back in the room? Hi, Tony. Hi, I don't know what's going on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm worried that we've lost our delegates. I can see uh, quite a few people are on. Oh, okay, are they? Um, sorry, good afternoon, everybody. This is a little confusing. I hope you can see and hear me now. And I do apologize for, as always, Murphy lurk, lurking around the corner and the technical glitches. But welcome once again to this blockchain special interest group webinar hosted by IOTPSA. And we are absolutely delighted that you can join us. Our guest speaker, as often on these cases, is John Singh. And uh, John, a very warm welcome to you as well. Thank you so much for once again taking the time to share your experiences and expertise with all of us. So I think as we are now a couple of minutes into our allotted time, I'd like to hand over to you, John, and once again, a warm welcome to everybody. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Tony, for the warm welcome, and welcome to all the attendees who, for making the time to be here. So the topic of the presentation is Blockchain Africa 2022 report back. And in this presentation, I will summarize some of the more interesting presentations in Blockchain Africa. As, um, as of the last couple of years, Blockchain Africa is now a virtual event, so it was not live. And one of the interesting things is that there were a lot of panel discussions in this particular um, Af Blockchain Africa event. And... I did find it a bit difficult to, uh, you know, to, to get content out of them, but I managed to put together a few presentations and interesting uh, report back for you. And the other interesting fact was that there was no presentation on NFTs or the metaverse or some of the more uh, current and exciting topics in blockchain. So that was interesting. It was mentioned a few times, but uh, you know, not really a dedicated presentation. So let's uh, get on to the contents. So let's look at uh, six presentations, because as I said, there were quite a number of panel events, so it was difficult to get um, like structured content out of it. So at least I found it difficult. So we'll work with these, and hopefully you'll find some of them valuable information. So the first presentation was one called uh, Hacks and Checks, and it was by Jeff May, who is the Director of Global Strategy at Huobi Global. So Jeff leads global expansion efforts and for Huobi, who is one of the world's leading crypto exchanges. So he spoke about that there is a rise in crypto uh, and assets over the years, and this has attracted cyber criminals' attention. 
So $1.7 billion was stolen in 2018. $915 million was theft from crypto exchanges itself. So they are a target for uh, these hackers and people that are wanting to do cyber criminal activity. So these exchanges actually have to have very good um, security standards in order to uh, deter these hackers. So some of the largest hacks that have been recorded was BitGrail was in 2018. So this is an ex Italian exchange and $146 million was hacked and about 230,000 users lost funds. Then KuCoin in 2020, $281 million stolen by suspected North Korean hackers. So this is a seashells based exchange. And then Mount Cox, was, which is one of the original exchanges that were hacked in 2014, 450 million dollars. Now Mount Cox was Japanese based, and but they they had a they were one of the first exchanges. So and they weren't really structured and didn't have all their security in place. So they were an easy target for hackers at the time. So the largest transaction stolen was uh, South Korean exchange was hit by a major attack in November 2019. So $49 million was stolen in a single transaction. So this actually unveiled a large case of money laundering dealing with North Korean hackers. So it, it did lead to a larger criminal syndicate as well. So some of the security risks in the, in the various areas of crypto are as follows, right? So on exchanges, you can get hot wallets stolen. So hot wallets are those that actually live in the cloud and on the exchanges. And normally it's the exchange itself that controls the private keys. So they are a target for hackers because it's not the individual that controls the private keys, but the exchange. So there's also data breaches, account theft, and also the, the other important one is insiders committing crimes. Because obviously the insiders will understand how the organization works and they have a good chance of finding flaws in the system. So the exchanges really do have to have good security mechanisms in place. They've got to have good standards and processes because otherwise they will be hacked. So it's become more and more important that they have a very high standard of uh, security and process. And then when it comes to wallets, especially owned by individuals, individuals can easily lose their private keys because if they don't write them down and take care of keeping them safe, they can be either stolen or lost, and then their funds are lost. They can also be the victims of account theft, hacking, and also bugs in the wallet software itself. When it comes to blockchain itself, um, although they are quite sophisticated um, pieces of software, they can also suffer from transaction rollbacks. They can have crowding out attacks, 51% attacks, random number attacks, especially when it comes to um, proof of stake, and then consensus bugs, you know, how, how they all uh, coordinate and, um, and, and synchronize together. And uh, these kind of things can be uh, result in a loss of funds sometimes. And then when it comes to smart contract development, obviously this is software. And even though it's, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's not a hard uh, languages to learn, if you don't take care in the security in your software, then you can be the victim of uh, security attacks. You can have development bugs. Also, the underlying operating environment can have bugs. Flash loan attacks have also been quite popular. So in a fl flash loan attack, what happens is that um, the criminal can take out a huge loan. So there, there are uh, decentralized finance platforms that allow them to take out huge loans for, for just a few seconds, you can take it out, do your transaction, and then return the funds to that uh, decentralized finance um, platform. And these allow them to, to do things like arbitrage attacks so that if there's a slight mismatch in pricing, they can take a huge amount of money, push it into the one, one uh, token, and then sell it back again and earn a profit, right? So those kind of attacks do happen. It's business logic design, scams, phishing, and attacks. So 
quite a number of activities happening in the space and you know people have to be really uh, careful. So when it comes to countermeasures, so especially for exchanges, it's important to have hot and cold wallet separation. So 98% of digital assets are stored in multi-signature cold wallets. So that's on the Huobi platform. And also they have multiple backups of private keys. Huobi also has 15 private key controllers with multi-signature mechanisms. They also have in-house developed security hardware and stringent security processes. When it comes to user level recommendations, it is recommended that you ensure the security of your personal wallets. Make sure that your private keys and your um, mnemonic seeds are stored carefully. It's better to have a, a paper backup than to store them online, etc. And then choose an investment institution with stringent security. And also make sure that access to your email account is secure because a lot of times your user account is actually your email address, especially on exchanges. So be careful with those as well. Now, um, so to end off, um, he also said that decentralized finance networks are being targeted. So you can see that in uh, they've, they've uh, increased to over $2 billion uh, being stolen from these decentralized finance network. So it's on on the rise. And, and again, it goes back to smart contract development affair. How how secure are smart contracts on these uh, on these decentralized finance platforms? And that's um, that is a, a concern. I actually uh, spoke about this uh, last year in about February when I and I did a presentation here on simplification, uh, you know, uh, decentralized finance security simplified where I spoke about how we, how investors could investors could evaluate smart contracts and understand whether they secure and whether the project is you know actually uh, doing a good job of uh, writing secure code and and also in the functionality that they provide so that was um, hacks and checks presentation so the, the next one was um, one on Polkadot, which is a blockchain uh, platform, and it's a multi multi chain uh, platform. And the presentation was given by Siddharth Singhal, so he's a director of enterprise at Parity Technologies. So Parity is responsible for driving the adoption of Polkadot, Kusama, and Substrate amongst inter enterprises. So he holds a master's and an MBA. So when it comes to developing custom blockchains, there's a number of challenges. So the one is overhead. So it takes years and dollars to build a blockchain from scratch. Also in terms of isolation, because blockchains can't really talk to each other without going through centralized services. And then with security, blockchains naturally compete with each other over security resources, leaving each one of them less secure so so what was needed um, obviously is polka dot in in the opinion of the presenter so so when we look at polka dot it, it tries to solve some of these problems such as performance so, so what we need is higher throughput um, on blockchains so they solved it by building heterogeneous uh, sharding so that's basically splitting your chains into different um, blockchain so that transactions can run uh, in parallel and they've done quite a bit of work on this and then sovereignty so they had a network of true agency so this is explicit on-chain governance where, where where the actual community can vote on chain for things like upgrades for the next innovation and in, on the on the chain and also the future of the actual um polka dot itself and with security what was needed was secure and efficient consensus. So the Polkadot use nominated proof of stake. In terms of overhead, what was needed was a low cost of building these blockchains. So Polkadot introduced Substrate, which is a modular software development kit for blockchain, which makes it easier to build your own custom blockchain, but then being able to plug in into the Polkadot infrastructure. Then it comes to uh, Isolation, you need 
need your blockchains to be highly composable. So you need to be able to to uh, compose together a number of functionality from different blockchains. And this is where Polkadot built in cross-chain messaging so that chains can interact with each other in an easy and standard way. And then customizable. So you need a customizable runtime development so you can do upgrades, etc. And when it comes to upgrades, then you want you want your blockchain to be able to upgrade without hard and soft forks, right? So, so they they have very unique mechanisms when it comes to upgrading. There's also an on-chain treasury that ensures funding of upgrades as well. So it's, this is all being created to make it easier to have a multi-chains and to make the the development and running of custom blockchains easier. So. When uh, blockchains first came out, obviously it was first Bitcoin and Ethereum became the next popular one. These were public permissionless networks. And then there was also a move towards uh, private permission networks. And this was at the, at the front of this was Hyperledger. So this was for perhaps large corporates that wanted their own private uh, blockchain, so a few of them together, they didn't want just anyone to be able to see transactions like in a, in a public blockchain. So they built security around it so that only um, a few private members could access this uh, blockchain network. And then Polkadot has now arrived, and this is a hybrid multi-chain network, which is a little bit different to the prior um, networks that have been around for a while. So the, in terms of network elements, Polkadot has a relay chain. So this is the heart of Polkadot. So it's responsible for shared security, consensus, and cross-chain interoperability. So it doesn't really process transactions as such, but it's more responsible for securing the network and making sure that other blockchains can plug into it. Then you have parachains. So these are sovereign blockchains or blockchains that can stand on their own that can have their own tokens and their own use cases, but they plug into the relay chain and they can make use of the security of the chain. So that's the power of the relay chain is that it combines all these different uh, block, uh, blockchains and creates one super uh, security model that's, uh, that doesn't depend on just, just one of them, right? And there's parathreads, so similar to parachains, but with a pay-as-go model. So it's more con economical if continuous connectivity is not needed. Then the other element is bridges. So you want parachains and parathreads to be able to connect with external networks like Ethereum and Bitcoin. The, we also mentioned the substrate ecosystem. So this is like a software development kit that Polkadot um, provides that allows the development of custom Blockchain, so it allows you to build, deploy, and monitor blockchains, spark contracts, and user interfaces. So to build blockchains, you have substrate, node templates, benchmarking. You can build smart contracts, frame palettes, and simulation uh, software. And then when it comes to building client apps, they have a JavaScript API and apps, codec, substrate connect, archiving, browser extensions, and signer apps. Then when it comes to deployment, they have a full-blown deployment solution. You can also deploy to containers like Docker and Kubernetes and a Polkadot secure validator. And when it comes to monitoring the blockchain, there's network telemetry, analytics, instrumentation, dashboards and visualizations, etc. So it's a full solution to, to, to the problem of building a custom blockchain, both from development, run uh, deployment, and running it. So it's a very comprehensive solution that they have uh, presented. So let's move on to the next uh, presentation. So the next one was more of a panel discussion, but I just, uh, so this is the value of uh, self-sovereign identity to SA organizations. So I just included the moderator, which was Lohan Spiss. So he's the founder and CEO of Didix and chairman of Sovereign Stuart Castle, so he's been a co-founder of various cybersecurity and blockchain-based ventures. His latest venture, Didex, focuses on self, 
sovereign identity and cyber security. So when it comes to self-sovereign identity, uh, when, the, when the internet was created, it was created without an identity layer. So there's hundreds of accounts on many different platforms. And so whenever you, you open an account for, on a different website, you have a different username, an account and password, and it becomes quite difficult to manage. But in the real world, we can use our driver's license to prove identity. So, so we need something like this similar in the digital space. And two problems need to be solved to verify a digital credential. Okay, so the format needs to be standardized. And we need standard way to verify the source and integrity of digital credentials. So diagrammatically, uh, you know, in a simplistic level, we have a verifiable claim such as, you know, a bank account statement or some other form of documentation that's issued. So, so example, in, in example of a uh, bank, bank statements, the issuer would be a bank. They would issue have an issuing protocol to the owner. And then the verifier would want to verify this claim. And it always helps when the, if the verifier knows the issuer because they have some kind of existing trust relationship. But this is not ideal in, in a world where, where you're actually not, uh, not always uh, sure of the identity of the, of the issuer. And, but you still need to be able to trust them because you do want to do business with, with this uh, person, right? But you need to verify certain information about them. And this is where like a blockchain solution uh, comes in because your issuer can sign a claim of, and issue this claim, for example, a bank statement, and then the owner can countersign the claim and, and, and in return, he will get back his decentralized identifier and you can present this claim to the verifier so now the verifier doesn't have to know or trust the issuer because he knows that if he can verify the signature then it is a trusted transaction on the blockchain and and he and knows that you know it is a valid claim so in south africa at the moment we do have a entity called the digital data bank so they are not blockchain based, but what they do have is an API to integrate into home affairs, then do biometric and facial identity to create an identity. So then the person can then interact with any person on the internet and they will know they are verified. So the digital ledger in the person's vault and, and every interaction is recorded in that digital ledger. Still, it's not an ideal solution because it's, um, you still need, you still have the central entity and you still have these, these centralized relationships and, and what is needed is, you know, something a little bit more flexible than this. So the other solution that's currently in South Africa is the secure citizen identification. So in this solution, a person is digitally enrolled in the, in the system uh, using fingerprinting, voice recognition and facial recognition. So this digital ID allows a person to interact with multiple companies, but they can still control the data and still comply with Papaya, KYC and AML. So KYC is know your customer and AML is anti-money laundering. But the important thing is that the person can choose what data they want to show uh, the person seeking verification. So if only your age is needed, then you don't have to show your address or, or other important information. So from a business point of view, there is a digital identity community trying to create standards for digital ID. So the, the third presence in South Africa is BankServe. So BankServe is tr actually trying to build a blockchain solution for uh, this particular self-sovereign identity uh, situation. So, so obviously banks have high friction costs especially when it comes to know your customer and anti-money laundering. Fraud is also expensive. It's a huge cost to the industry. The banks uh, want and their partners want to build a trust model and digital identity framework. So in their solution, layer one will be a Hyperledger blockchain. So Hyperledger is a um, open source 
a blockchain development platform, but it's it's very much for permissioned blockchain networks. So this will be a permissioned network. It will have peer-to-peer -peer communication and also trusted issuers. So that could be quite a exciting innovation for self-sovereign self identity banks. So actually brings this project to fruition. So that's the end of self-sovereign identity. And the next presentation was interesting one on uh, e-livestock, so global press traceability solution. So Christopher Light is the founder and CEO of eLivestock. So he's a seasoned executive, entrepreneur, technologist, and program manager, 25 years experience. His work has involved three years on site as a technology advisor for agriculture and environment for the Africa Bureau, including for the presidential initiative to end hunger in Africa. So very experienced and very active on, on this continent. So, so why did they decide to do an e-livestock solution? So in 2018, there was an outbreak of tick-borne disease that, which led to the death of 50,000 cattle in Zimbabwe. So this was the last straw in the collapse of the national dipping system. So this, the lack of traceability and electronic traceability left Zimbabwe unable to export to markets in Europe and the Middle East, which lost, which led to a loss of profits for farmers and left them in, in a bit of dire straits. So, so a hardware solution was proposed. So to have RFID smart tags, which stores and provides information about each animal. So in this case, it's uh, cattle and it uses uh, UHF RFID. It's also an RFID scanner. So it picks up each animal's unique information and transmits to an application. So the application on a, a smartphone a device like an Android device or iPhone, so this global app will gather animal data and organize it cleanly for portable digital data management. So that was the hardware solution proposed. And this also helps with livestock collateralization because the insurance industry doesn't want to insure the farmers and provide them with cheap and affordable insurance because there's no traceability. Also, the banking sector is also hamstrung because there's no access to electronic identification. So smallholder farmers struggle to get insurance, they struggle to access loans, and they rely on donor-funded projects that may not be suitable. So one of the solutions is a smart contract for cattle collateralization. So in block one of the of the uh, interaction, there's a insurance disimbursement or a loan. And then over the next 12 blocks, there's payments, payments done. And at the end of the 12 blocks, then you close off the loan or the insurance and everyone uh, continues as they were. So this is a blockchain based solution to the problem, which seems to be uh, working quite successfully and allows actual farmers, small holding farmers to access insurance. They also have these digital traceability, which helps uh, them able, which helps give them access to loans and insurance. So they also came out with the digital wallet. Uh, so this allows farmers to bundle transactions together to save fees, allows them to be financially included because quite a number of small holding uh, cattle owners don't actually have access to bank accounts. So having a wallet provide them with the means of doing financial transactions in a digital way and provides the option for additional services. And it, it helps with the fees because if you can bundle transactions together, then that, that, that assists with the, with some of the fees of blockchain based fees and also other, other fees that are incurred. So that was the presentations on e-livestock and the next one is is from um, is about divergence or convergence so cdbc stable coins and crypto so this herco stain is is part of uh, south african reserve bank is one of the senior fintech specialists he's also the chairperson of the sa intergov fintech working group and he's 
belongs to a number of special uh, of, of regulatory working groups and he has interests in crypto assets, stable coins, uh, global stable coins and uh, DeFi. He holds a PhD from the University of Pretoria, MSc of Finance from the University of London. So what he noted was that is that the essence of finance is some kind of record keeping, that is some kind of uh, ledger to record transactions. So one of the challenges is that if technology is advancing faster than financial institutions, which is happening in the case of crypto and blockchain based uh, initiatives. So the reason for this is the reluctance to change from banks. They're also quite conservative. So they do miss quite a number of opportunities. So if we look at the centralized versus decentralized, there's a number of trade-offs which, uh, which we are constantly uh, coming, coming up against. So in centralized models, there's rent, rent extraction. So that means that you know, there's quite a number of fees and costs involved and sometimes consumers actually don't don't know why they're paying them and there's also a single point of failure and then when it comes to the decentralized world world you do have uh, concerns about scalability transaction throughput and also coordination amongst uh, decentralized nodes etc so all these things do uh, do have their advantages and disadvantages and there's been quite a number of innovations in the GLT or decentralized ledger technology ecosystem. So we started out with Bitcoin around about 2008, 2009, which proved that decentralized ledger technologies can work. Then all coins came out. So these were basically, um, they, they were a copy most of the time of, of the Bitcoin software, but some changes in parameters also slight improvements and in terms of privacy and all kinds of other innovations. So that improved speed and cost. They weren't as successful as Bitcoin, but yet they did They did show some advancements in, in trying to improve whatever deficiencies were, were, were shown up in Bitcoin. There were smart contracts, programmable money, especially with Ethereum coming out in 2015 or so. And this allowed uh, people to program on on the blockchain, programmable money, led to things, innovations like decentralized finance, and then stable coins also came out. So this was this was done to try and counteract the volatility in in the in the crypto marketplace. So in order to do things like loans, etc., you do need uh, currency that's a little bit more stable and not so volatile. 2017 or so was capital raising boom in, in uh, ICOs or, and uh, this is where blockchain based companies were trying to raise funds for their projects, etc. And then CBDC or central bank digital currencies, this, this is central banks trying to build their own uh, uh, central bank currency, digital currencies and China and Nigeria have been successful. Institutional investments started coming through in a big time in 2021 and earlier. Um, so some large institutes starting to put money into, into Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. And then decentralized finance has been you know, quite strong in the last couple of years, so also known as DeFi. And this has also introduced you know, innovations in finance, especially in loans and uh, and being able to provide uh, collateral in exchange for, for, for loans. So those are the innovations that have come through. And then key stats is there's about 18,400 crypto assets, currently around about a $1.8 trillion market cap and between 600,000 and 900,000 Bitcoin transactions a day. There's plus minus 100 million users. So the number of users holding at least one Bitcoin is approaching uh, 1 million. So it's growing, and but, it's, but still, it's, it's, it's still relatively small compared to some of the, something like gold or, or other established uh, assets at the moment. So stable coins 
also has some important use cases. So it acts as a bridge between fiat currencies and volatile digital assets. So it serves as collateral for crypto asset digital transactions, allows for trading, lending, and borrowing because it, it provides some sort of form of stability and it's very used, much used as collateral in DeFi. So you can put in crypto and get out stable coin as loans. So that kind of things are quite popular and that's what it's used for quite a bit. In C CBDC or central bank digital currencies, there are 68 countries working on CBDC research or proof of concepts. So there's 13 countries testing pilots, two countries launched official CBDC. So this is China and Nigeria. Uh, South African Reserve Bank is doing a CBDC feasibility study. They're doing Project COCA 2. And they're going to be experimenting with this amongst the with interbank transactions, etc. Right. And uh, so how do we put all these things together in a fiat CBDC and and stable coins. So, so at the moment, uh, there is some work being, being done on it. So this is the committee for, um, a committee has been formed by the G20 group. And what they're looking at is to enhance cross-border payments, make them more efficient, transparent, and, you know, just, just improve it in general for, for everybody. So, they're looking at a number of building blocks. So the first is the public and private sector commitment. So what they want to do is to set a number of achievable goals. So, so goals, for example, such as improving transparency, speed, and also trying to align all the different um, legislation across different countries. And then the next is regulatory, supervisory, and oversight framework. So they want alignment between the countries in terms of regulation, same KYC, same AML rules, et cetera. So sometimes this is difficult to do because uh, countries do, do still want to, to protect themselves. But they're trying to align it as much as possible because this, this, this does create complexity and confusion you know, when trying to do um, cross-border payments. They want to try and improve existing payment structures and arrangements, modernize uh, infrastructures in various countries, et cetera, you know, try to encourage countries to do that. And then data and market practices. So try to standardize on, on formats like ISO standards for data exchange. So that makes it easier to exchange data and also for legacy systems to interact with them. And then also forward in terms of future thinking, they want to look at new payment infrastructures and arrangements. So look at bringing in central bank digital currencies, stable coins, and try to utilize them to, to improve cross-border payments. So, so these are the initiatives being done to try and uh, align and get these all these different technologies working together so that we can enhance and improve cross-border payments and remittances. So last but not least is uh, the keynote addressed by Charles Hoskinson, so he's founder and CEO of uh, Input Output Hong, Hong Kong. He's also the founder of Cardano, which is quite a uh, popular blockchain and smart contract technology. He's a Colorado-based technology entrepreneur and mathematician. They attended Metrop Metropolitan State University of Denver and University of Colorado Boulder to study analytic number theory before moving into cryptography to industry exposure. So here was just a, a discussion around uh, around Africa. So what he did say was that uh, so the blockchain is not so much about the tokens or market capitalizations, but it's about systems because what what the blockchain community is trying to sell is systems that that don't require a middleman. They're trying to sell peer to peer systems instead of relying on a trusted actor. When it comes to global business, we all need to work together and work well without deciding on a controlling entity. We need to allow the masses to come together and innovate in a trustless, permissionless global way. 
This is now a reality with many blockchain-based communities able to do this. So according to Charles, Africa is one of the most entrepreneurial economies amongst all the continents. So this is a good match to blockchain-based technologies. We have the right age, right level of digitization and skill. There's also a genuine desire to chase the future. So it looks for him, it looks well for Africa because people are, are, are hungry for, for this kind of innovation and for chasing the future. So some of the challenges is that obviously Africa doesn't have the best infrastructure and digitization is not easily available in remote areas. There needs to be a great deal of training on technology, but also on economic and financial systems because uh, with, with, with the blockchain-based initiatives, you're getting quite a number of innovations in finance, but but if you do introduce those innovations, then you leave from a lot, lot of legacy and an outdated technology that's used in, in banking all across the world. So that's that's the kind of benefits that you can get if, if these are introduced. So Charles Hos Hoskinson also believes that there will be a pan-African cur currency. He thinks the world will slowly start moving away from the dollar a pan-African currency will materialize over the next 10 years. So it's possible that this currency will not be regulated by a super central bank, but will be crypto. So that's that's what he is, uh, one of his biggest um, fortune telling was. So he, he strongly believes this and uh, and he could he could be right because Africa is, you know, on the is really trying to be innovative and trying to build new systems that you know that will allow them to you know really leapfrog into the future. So that was the uh, end of the of his of his presentation. He did say towards the end that each individual needs to get involved. Okay, because in blockchain there's no credential, there's no governing body, so it's all about self-selection. Okay, you start with a problem and a philosophy, and you get a group of people together and solve it using the blockchain. And that's what he strongly uh, believes in. So, so thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. That was the end of the summary of all the presentations. I found it to be, to be, uh, to be quite interesting. But again, there were quite a number of panel discussions. And um, you know, it, was, it was a little bit difficult to try and get structured content out of it. But I hope that uh, these presentations I've shown have uh, given some value to you as a community. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tony. Let's hand over back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse, me. Excuse me. Thank you, John. And my voice is really going, so I'm not going to talk much. John, are you able to see the Q&A only on the chat? Uh, can I only see the chat? Oh, Q&A only, yes. So, so may I suggest that you scroll down to the bottom and start from there because then you can answer the questions okay. in the order that they were asked. Uh, I'm sorry, my voice is going and I really want the okay. audience to have to put it with my croaky voice. Um, if you're unsure of what the question refers to, we'll need to ask the person to comment in the chat and I'll monitor that. But uh, otherwise, back to you. Thank you, John. And by the way, a very informative session. Um, wow, is all I can say. How long was the conference? It was two days Oh, okay, you can see that. And these are your highlights. Yeah, just highlights. Uh, yeah, there were quite a few panel discussions, so I, uh, <clears throat> I was finding it a bit difficult to get structured content from here. So it's a lot less presentation than I, than I would have liked to have shown, but unfortunately, yeah. this is what I could get out of it, yeah. <laughs> it, it might give the um, some of the attendees a bit of a taste of maybe registering for themselves next year. But John, yeah. thank you for that, and I'll leave the questions to you. We have about 15 minutes still, so back to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, everyone, for the questions. So the first one is from Al Rashid Mustafa. So he asked, does their security system in place, such as implementing SWIFT system? He also says uh, transaction rollback is very dangerous. How can you stop something uh, like that? So, so in the first question, uh, I'm assuming he's, 
I'm not sure what the context of his question was in terms of uh, soft system, but uh, obviously soft is is the uh, is the preferred method of international remittance uh, at the moment, and so with any blockchain based system obviously security will be a, a concern and that's where cryptography etc comes comes into play but when it comes to um like organizations like the g20 trying to to do remittance they will they will have to to, to focus on that because uh it's uh, it is quite a concern but I, i'm not sure if i'm answering the question because i'm not really sure uh what he was trying to ask and then i agree that transaction rollback is very dangerous and um but it in a blockchain based uh, system it is it can it can cause concern because blockchains are meant to be immutable and great care has to be taken that these that these don't take place because then you can it can result in double spending etc so when it comes to the the stopping of that, they, there are various mechanisms in place, but they're they're highly technical. But but most of the teams do uh, do concentrate on trying to avoid uh, such kind of things happening as well. Here, so the next question is from uh, Ntuzeni Mabidi. I don't think I pronounced that correctly, but uh, so the, the the question is: How safe are the hardware wallets? and accept losing them. So, I mean, I, I do own a, a hardware wallet myself. I think they are quite fantastic and I think they are super safe. Obviously, you do have to um, make sure that you keep your, your mnemonic seeds in a safe place. So you can't keep your hardware wallet and your seeds together. So you gotta have separate places for them. Ideally, they should be locked in safes Etc. So you do have to have to take quite a quite a bit of responsibility yourself because you need to have some kind of safety mechanisms in place in case there's someone um, you know does try to to take them away from you. So it's important to have your seed and your hardware wallet separate. And apart from that, I think it's a fantastic technology. It, what it does is that it it generates uh, it generates new addresses for you every time you do a transaction, for example. It um, Also, there's passwords, safety on it, and it, it has these very neat way of, you know, you have to look at your, at the screen and look at the, the arrangement of the numbers. Only then can you type in, you know, various uh, things into the, into the hardware wallet. So I think it's a fantastic technology. Yeah. So the next question is from Johan Stein. Uh, what is the environment, environmental impact of this technology? I read somewhere it is estimated that each Bitcoin transaction uses around 2,100 kilowatt hours, which is just roughly what an average US household consumes 75 days. Will the environmental impact decrease over time? That's a, that's a, that is a very pertinent question. Obviously, with technologies like Bitcoin that use proof of work, it uses quite a bit of electricity and there's concerns about carbon footprint and how much of electricity it uses so what i can say is that you know the there are there is quite a bit of work on blockchains moving to proof of stake and that's one mitigation of this and so proof of stake doesn't use it's not as energy intensive and it uses different mechanisms to try and uh, and uh, move away from this problem. However, blockchain, uh, sorry, Bitcoin is still the number one blockchain and it still uses proof of work and which is uh, quite environmentally, uh, it was quite heavy on the environment. So, so one of the things is obviously to move to clean energy. So things like uh, solar and etc. cetera, but um, the, so that depends on, you know, the entire world moving more in that direction and, and I think uh, like the Bitcoin miners will move as well if if there is cheap enough electricity from these clean clean type of energies and there's, there's also a, a um, thought leaders that think that you know the 
electricity consumption is is a function of what the consumer wants right so so in the case of bitcoin there is a a real desire for for miners and other interested people to be able to mine and therefore there is a there is a need for this electricity consumption and if if it wasn't bitcoin for example consuming this electricity there will be something else some other need for it so it's not the so much the fact that it's bitcoin using it is it's a bigger it's a bigger uh, uh, area of concern in that in general the world is using uh, non clean methods of, of of generating electricity and if it wasn't bitcoin using the electricity it would be something else so so i wouldn't say it's a it's a bitcoin problem as such, as such but 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 more of let's let's try and find cleaner ways of generating electricity and if those are found at an efficient and cost effective manner then bitcoin mining will follow suit as well yeah that's my uh, take on it so we move to the next question um Jerome Demero okay you asked about the session being recorded sorry so there wasn't really a question so another question from Johan Stein how will blockchain technology impact society for good that is education and healthcare so i've i've seen a various uh initiatives especially on the healthcare side so 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 one of the things that um is of interest for example to to our healthcare um so to the, so the people that are leading healthcare in south africa is that you know they they want to try and find a way to use blockchain to um to have a, like a a way of storing people's uh, medical history in a safe secure way but also so that it can be shared easily amongst hospitals doctors and different medical practitioners obviously you don't want everyone to be able to see these records but they want to be able to use the technology so that you know you um so the authorized people will have access to these records and it can be easily shown because one of the problems at the moment is that especially in, in healthcare is that you go from doctor to doctor but your records sometimes don't go with you so you go to a hospital and your complete medical history may not be with them or you go to another doctor that you've been referred to as difficult for them to see your complete medical history and that's the kind of situation i think that they want to solve with that and also with with the education itself um i'm not sure if it can have a huge impact on 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 education because um education does does rely on uh, you know having quality content being created and you know educators willing to put in the time to do it so i, I don't i mean for me I, I don't i don't really see that blockchain will have a huge impact there but but it could i mean but i haven't seen too much information on people actually using it for that use but there could be i could be very wrong about it uh the next question is from Johan Stein um how is the SA Reserve Bank and SARS approaching this technology so with SARB and SARS they um they are they are open to it they they, re they realize that the technology is here and here to stay and then they have to find a way to work with it but their their challenge is trying to to understand it properly because especially with bitcoin and ethereum etc it's it can be used as a money it can be used as an asset to hold value it can be used as a security so there's many many ways of of using it and they have to understand fully all the various use cases which they have done so they produced a working paper on it and they have sent it out to all the different partners i can say that one of the the recommendations for example is to really firm up um regulation on, on exchanges so ch exchanges may need to re be registered as uh, you know foreign exchange providers etc because they see it as you know almost 
very similar to foreign exchange, and so they have to be foreign exchange, be licensed and, and registered as such. There will be more tighter control on, uh, you know, taxation as a controlling that aspect of it as well. But they're not against uh, crypto. Uh, crypto, I don't think, will be legal tender in South Africa. The, um, the, our, monitor, our legal tender will continue to be the RAND at this point in time. Also, uh, South African Reserve Bank has also been involved in various, um, for example, they've they've had like a pilot between the different banks to try and understand how interbank transfers can be um, can be designed. So they, they did a project called Project Coca, and they, they successfully were able to do interbank transfers amongst uh, various banks, like there was Central, Central Reserve Bank and EPSA and a few other banks. And you know, it was a successful pilot, and they will build upon that, I think, in, in the future. So they're definitely not against it. And they they are they are willing to work with it and understand it. Okay, the last question from Johan Stein. So it says, uh, how will the development of the metaverse impact blockchain tech? So yeah, that's um, that's a really good question. So so it's still early days on the metaverse. What what we what is being seen at the moment is, you know, you can see that large corporates like Facebook and uh, <clears throat> etc. are taking huge interest in this because they, they, they're starting to see that, you know, if you want to, that social media was one stage in this whole, uh, in this whole journey, but now we're moving to, this, to, a, to another level and they're calling it the metaverse, right? But it's, it's going to be, a, it's going to be based on, open blockchains is going to be based on being able to people to, to have digital identities that can move between these different blockchains. So the impact on this is that there's got to be a lot of more interoperability between blockchain tech. So you can't have these islands of blockchains with their own tokens, with their own governance, with their own, you know, com communities just doing things in isolation. So it's going to be a lot more focused on interoperability so that People with digital identities can move seamlessly between these blockchains. So they can, they can game. They can do in it by purchase NFTs. They can purchase skins, etc., for the games all seamlessly. And that, that's, I think, will be the the biggest impact. You know, just more focus on interoperability. So I think that I'm out of time, Tony. We got uh, two minutes, I think, John, and maybe oh, a very quick comment on the last question from a. Hakuna okay, so it's an interesting uh, question. Sorry. So the last question, Hakuna and Doro, what are the effects of Russia, Ukraine war on driving move to blockchain globally? Yeah, I think it's 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 been a very interesting to see how uh, funds have flowed into Ukraine from you know using crypto. That's been a important use case for it. And and also, you know, because Swift payments have been stopped to to Russia, and there's been all kinds of sanctions. They also have moved to to to, to Russia has also tended to move towards crypto as well. So it has driven adoption in those countries, but I don't think it's a like a permanent state of affairs. It's a state of affairs brought about by extreme challenges that they're facing. But when it comes to gov governments, they do tend to try want to control. The currency they do want to regulate they do want to think and they can't really regulate crypto as well as their own currency so i think it's a temporary move and it's expedient but i don't think you can read too much into it in terms of you know global block uh, using blockchain globally thanks john thank you so much for a very comprehensive presentation and equally comprehensive answers uh, i think your, your knowledge and your, um, your insights suit me are very welcome and appreciated by all of the audience, as I can judge by the comments. <clears throat> Excuse me to the members who've posed questions and comments. Thank you so much for participating. It's always very important. And a very quick reminder to our KwaZulu Natal members the annual general meeting of the chapter of KZM is next week, Thursday, the 7th of April. So if you haven't registered, please do so. John, thank you so, so much for your time and, and 
you know, highlighting the highlights, if I may say so, of the conference and answering the questions so well. To everyone on the webinar, thank you for joining us. We appreciate your participation and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye for now.